Very good. All right, so this morning, uh, we are coming to the conclusion um, of our series entitled uh, The Last Day. Uh, over the last uh, few weeks, we looked at the last day, the last 24-hour period of Jesus' life uh, before he went to the cross, before he was crucified. Um, we started this story, we started the, uh, the narrative of Jesus in the upper room uh, during the Last Supper, spending a, a last meal, a last teaching time with his um, 12 disciples, Uh, He washed their feet. He talked about how Judas was going to betray him. He taught them about humility, and he taught them about love. So it's just this this big, long uh, three-hour period of Jesus teaching his disciples, giving them their final instructions. Um, And then after that, uh, they leave, and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, which is in the Mount of Olives. And uh, there he goes, and he spends three hours in prayer, uh, spending time with his father before he goes to the cross. And it's while he is in the garden that the uh, band of soldiers come and Judas come and, and they take him. And then he goes on trial before Caiaphas and Herod uh, and Pilate. And this all accumulates into him um, going to the cross, being condemned to death. He is whipped and beat and flogged. Um, and he's taken to Golgotha where he is nailed to a cross and raised up there to die. This 24-hour period um, ends with Jesus on the cross. The, 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 the time frame is up with him on the cross when he says it is finished and he surrenders his soul. But the story doesn't end there. If the story ended there, if that was the end of story, uh, this would be the worst story ever told. This story would not be worth wasting our time. This would be just another common man ending his life. So today what we're going to do is we're going to look at the end of the story. And that's Jesus coming out of the tomb. You see, up until this point, nothing really remarkable has happened. How many of y'all ate dinner last night? Now, I know y'all ate dinner. Why are y'all not raising your hands? What's going on? So how many of y'all ate dinner tonight? Yeah, yeah, or last night. Yeah, and today. Y'all probably already ate. How much candy have y'all ate today? Like, everybody eats dinner. You know, nobody, this is not a a different thing. It's not special. There's nothing special about the fact that Jesus had dinner uh, with with his friends. Jesus went to the garden to pray. There's nothing special about that. Jesus spent a lot of time in the garden praying. He spent a lot of time praying to his father. Jesus was arrested and put on trial. There's nothing special there. A lot of people go on trial. A lot of people are condemned to death, especially in this time. Jesus was taken to the cross and killed by the Romans through crucifixion. There's nothing new there, nothing special there. The Romans killed thousands of people in Judea during this time. So up until this point in our narrative, up until this point of our story, nothing special has happened. Nothing miraculous Nothing worth noting, really. But like I said, it's not the end of the story. The rest of the story can be found in all four Gospels of Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, and John 20. Here's the account of the rest of the story from Matthew 28. Now after the Sabbath, toward the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing white as snow. And for the fear of him, the guards trembled and became like dead men. But the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he has risen, as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And behold, he is going before you into Galilee. And there you will see him. See, I have told you. So they depart quickly from the tomb with great fear and joy. And they ran to tell the disciples. And behold, Jesus met them and said, Greetings. And they came up and took hold of his feet and worshipped him. And Jesus said to them, Do not be afraid. Go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee. And there they will see me. See, this is the joy of the resurrection. Imagine with me for a moment, and I know that, you know, on Easter Sunday, you know, uh, this is a passage that we read. This is a story that we read a lot. Uh, For most of you, this is not a new story. You know, for most of you, I didn't just ruin the ending of the book. Um, Most of you all have heard this story before. But imagine with me for a moment what was going on in Mary Magdalene's mind, in her heart, in her soul. Here she goes to the tomb with the sole purpose of of anointing the body and putting spices on the body so the rotting corpse wouldn't stink. That's what what they're going for. 
But here, this angel's at the tomb. The tomb is open. He said, come on in and look where he was. He ain't here no more. I know you're looking for Jesus who they crucified, but he's not here anymore. And then they're going back. They're going back to the disciples. And here's Jesus on the road saying, greetings. Greetings. He's like, what is up? How you doing? Can you imagine what was going through her mind? I'm sure her stomach dropped out. I'm sure she just freaked out. Can you just imagine? Now, all of these, the, the followers of Jesus, they would have been filled with confusion and joy, happiness, fear, elation. I bet they were just completely dumbfounded. And here is Jesus. We just watched him die on a cross, but now here he is, alive. Hope was restored. You see, this whole thing, you know, the disciples were watching Jesus die. All of their hope was gone. Their hope was completely shattered. Their hope was dashed. Here is this man that they thought was the Messiah. Here's this man that was this great teacher, and they followed him. They did everything for him, and now he's dead. Their hope was gone. But here's Jesus out of the grave. On Sunday, when he comes out of that grave, all of their hope was restored. You see, the biblical text, if you read through these four chapters that we listed at the beginning, the biblical text differs a lot. You know, when you read one story, it almost seems like it's contradicting itself, uh, but it's actually the opposite. Uh, The disparity shows that that these, in fact, are good accounts. Four different people witnessed the same event, and they wrote it a different way. They wrote the same story. So from these four separate accounts, we can stitch together this perfect commentary of what actually happened. Jesus died on the cross, and Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus, uh, both members of the Sanhedrin, both members of the Jewish council, come and bury his body. They had to hurry to get it done uh, before the Sabbath they started. And they put Jesus in a tomb that was carved out of the rock, and they rolled a massive rock in place. And on that day, the high priest came to Pilate and asked for soldiers to come and guard that tomb and to seal that tomb up. That way nobody could get in or out. I'm sure they weren't worried about somebody getting out. They were worried about somebody getting in to the tomb to seal the body. So Pilate sends these guards in there. And so here we have this tomb carved out of the rock. A dead man is laying in it who's been crucified. He's been wrapped up. There's a, a stone in front of it. The stone is sealed, and there are soldiers standing outside of it. But then early Sunday morning, something happens. A great burst of light, an angel coming down and rolling the stone away, this great earthquake. And here's Jesus, who was dead, coming out of the tomb, alive. These women came to put spices on the body. They come and they find this tomb open and empty. And they head off to tell the disciples. And Jesus appears to many that first day. He appeared to two men on the road to Damascus. He appeared to the disciples. He appeared to the women at the tomb. And Paul says that he appeared to more than 500 people before ascending into heaven. So here it is, the greatest story ever told. A man who was dead, who is now alive. The greatest story ever told. But why is that so important? Why nearly 2,000 years ago do we still have a holiday um, marking this occasion? You see, this event that happened on Sunday morning in Galilee or in Jerusalem almost 2,000 years ago is the most important thing that's ever happened. It means everything. It affects everything, everything that we do. It is the central event of Christianity. Paul tells us how important this resurrection is for us in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Paul tells us that if Jesus is still in that tomb, if Jesus is still dead, then all of this is worthless. This church building is worthless. Uh, the songs we sang beforehand are worthless. My job is completely worthless, and, and there's no need for it. You being here, there's no point. It's completely in vain. It's worthless. If Jesus is still dead and still in that tomb, then the gospel is worthless. The Bible is worthless. Our faith is worthless. We're still all in sin. We will still be eternally dead when we die. You see, as Christians, if Jesus is still in the dead, we're the most pitiful fools on the planet, clinging to a worthless faith. Because without the resurrection of Jesus, there is no meaning and no purpose. That's why the resurrection of Jesus is the most important event. 
in all of history. That is why it is so important to know that Jesus did rise from the dead on that third day. The resurrection means everything. The resurrection means everything. It's the most important event throughout all history. The most important event in the Bible. Think about it. If Jesus didn't come out of the grave, nothing that happened on Friday matters. If Jesus didn't come out of the grave on Sunday, this entire last day of Jesus' life is completely worthless. The fact that Jesus went to the cross and took the nails and took the beating and took the flogging is completely worthless if he is still dead. Because here's the deal, I could go and be crucified. I could go and be whipped and have nails driven through my wrist and driven into my heel. And it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter to hill of beans because I'm going to still be dead by the end of it. In three days, I'm still going to be dead because only Jesus could come back from the dead. The resurrection changes everything. Jesus is not still in that grave. Jesus did, in fact, rise from the dead. Jesus is alive. Jesus died on the cross, and he was wrapped in that linen, and he was placed in the grave, and a huge stone was rolled, in fact, but he came out. But he came out. You see, the resurrection means everything. It means everything to the apostles. It means everything um, to anyone who has come to Christ since then, and it means everything to us as followers of Christ here in the 21st century. You see, the benefits of the resurrection are endless. But there are two uh, just huge benefits, two of the biggest benefits from the resurrection, something that we must think about and hold to and hold fast to on a daily basis. The first of these is because Jesus rose from the dead, so can we. Because Jesus defeated death once and for all, then so can we. You see, if Jesus went into the grave and didn't defeat death, then we, that we had no chance. We have no chance to come back to life if he can't. Look at 1 Corinthians 15. We already read the first part of this, but we're going to read the end of that part. It says, now if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. But, our, but we, we are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testify about God that he raised from the dead, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you are still in your sins. Then those, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life, we are of all pity, all of all people to be most pitied. Paul is saying here that if Jesus did in fact defeat a death, then he defeated death for us too. Because here's the deal. If Jesus didn't defeat death forever, then when we die, we'd be dead for good. Jesus went to the cross and he went to the grave. But he came out and as a result, we can get out too. Because here's the deal, I'm going to give you a statistic. This is, this is one of the, the best statistics you'll ever hear. I'm 100% sure of this. One out of every single one of you will die at one point. It's for sure. It's, 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 it's for sure. One out of every one of you will die. You know, obviously, unless Jesus comes back before we die, we're all going to eventually run out of time here on earth. Our hearts will stop beating. Our brains will shut down. We'll, we'll be buried and put into the ground. But see, if Jesus didn't come back, if Jesus didn't defeat death, we would be there forever. But because Jesus did raise from the dead, then the resurrection is possible, not only for him, but for us as well. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote in Corinthians 15, 54, he said, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? For the sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Where is the victory of death? Where is death's sting? You see, as people who believe that Jesus went to the cross and died and then defeated death, we don't have to fear death. Death has no hold on us because we know that because of Jesus that that death is not the end for us. Where is your sting, O oh death? It has no sting on me because of Jesus coming out of that grave. 
And that leads us to the second major benefit of the resurrection. And that is because Jesus rose from the dead and came out of that grave, we have hope. We have hope. And we have hope on a grand scale. Grand with, with the hope of heaven. But we also have hope on a daily basis. The resurrection of Jesus gives us hope for eternal life. That, that, we, can, that we will go to heaven with him. But it also gives us hope for us to wake up every morning. Let's talk about the long term first. Jesus' resurrection gives us hope that after we die, we will go and live with him eternally in heaven. John says this, or John says, Jesus says this in John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have not told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and I will take you to myself. That where I am, you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So here Jesus is telling his disciples about heaven. And he's telling them about how he is going to heaven. He's going to prepare a place for them. And that everything will be there. And that Jesus is going to take us with him for eternity in heaven. Jesus is giving his disciples a promise of what is to come. He's giving them something to lean on when time gets tough. He's giving them a promise and an assurance of life. He's giving them a hope that extends to us. In Revelation 21, we see the greatest cause of hope ever, the greatest picture of hope ever. John says this, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. Then I saw a holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband, and a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Nor will there be any more mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. How great is this image that the Apostle John gives us? How great is this hope that we can see that one day we will be with God, with God, as, a, as his people, and he is our God. You see, it's the hope of the resurrection that makes that possible. Jesus coming out of the grave is what makes that possible. Without Jesus, making, without Jesus defeating death, none of that could ever be possible. You see, although our, our hope for eternity is great, that's not the only hope that we have. We have hope on a daily basis because of the resurrection, because of the life that he gives, because of the confidence that he gives. All we need to live in this world, this crazy world that we live in, is hope of the resurrection. You know, the world's a hopeless place sometimes. It's always been hopeless without God, but it seems like the world is just spinning out of control more and more every day. We live in a world that's short on hope. But we have the source of ultimate hope. It's a hope that gives us peace. It's a hope that gives us understanding. It's a hope that allows us to get through each and every day. The resurrection gives us life and it gives us forgiveness. And it gives us hope. You know, there are two men in the Bible... Two, two characters, two main characters in, in the gospel that show us this perfect picture of hope, of Christ's hope, of the hope that the resurrection brought. These two men lived two different lives, really, not really. These two men really lived the same life except for the very end, except for the last week of their lives. Let's take a second to think about and to contrast Peter the apostle, and Judas, the betrayer. They were both 12 of the, one of the tw two of the 12 disciples. They were with Jesus. They spent three years with Jesus, learning and growing. But in the last few days, both of them betrayed Jesus. Both of these men betrayed 
Jesus. Both Peter and Judas. Judas went to the, to the high priest and told him where Jesus was going to be and betrayed him into that um, and received 30 pieces of silver. But Peter denied even knowing who Jesus was. Not once, not twice, but three times. Both Peter and Judas were guilty of betraying their rabbi, their teacher, their friend. Both of these men were guilty of betraying the Son of God. Yet one we look at as one of the great founders of the church, Peter the Apostle, who wrote a good portion of the, of the New Testament, who we look at as one of the, 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 the foundational pieces of the faith. Yet the other we call Judas the betrayer. Anytime you see his name written in the Gospels, you see him as the betrayer or the one who betrayed Jesus. One we see as this saint, and the next one we see as this terrible, horrible, awful person. But why is that? In the last days of Jesus' life, they both betrayed him. Why do we look at one with good and one with bad? Why do we look at Judas with spite, yet look at Peter with admiration? And here's why. When Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the 30 pieces to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, what is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and he went and he hanged himself. Judas killed himself before the resurrection. Judas killed himself before Jesus came out of the tomb. So here's Judas. He sees that he has betrayed Jesus. He sees that the Son of God is now condemned and going to be killed. And he knows it's his fault. So in his guilt and in his, his grief of his sin, he goes out and he hangs himself and he dies. But what about Peter? Here's Peter um, at, the, at the trial of Jesus, and they say, wait, you know him. And he said, no, I don't know him. I never met the guy. I don't know the guy. Three times he denies him. Yet here's Peter, and he goes out, and he is, is in grief over his sin, and he is upset that he denied Jesus. But the next day, on Sunday, he goes to the tomb, and the tomb is empty. And Peter realizes there's forgiveness and there's grace because of the resurrection. Peter had hope because the cross wasn't the end of the story. Peter had hope because of the resurrection, but Judas, Judas had no hope. So the resurrection brings hope. The resurrection allows us to have eternal life with God. God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son to this earth to die a brutal death, to spill his blood for the atonement of our sins so he could go into the grave and battle with death and come out victorious. You see, Jesus loves us enough that he did that for us. It's because he loves us. It's because he loves us that he offers this beautiful peace, this beautiful gift of amazing grace. It's a gift um, that is a free gift for all people to forgive all of our sins, to fix all of our problems, to heal all of our wounds. Jesus has done all the work. Jesus has done all the work. And he's handing us this gift, fully gift wrapped. All we've got to do is open it. All we got to do is open this free gift of amazing grace. This power of grace and love. The power to raise us from the dead and give us life eternal. The grace and power to give us hope through all circumstances. All we have to do is open the gift. All we have to do is accept this free gift that Christ is offering and name him our Lord and Savior. You see Jesus dying on the cross and coming back from the dead is a gift to us because we can have life and hope. It's a free gift available to all human beings. It's all-encompassing, fully inclusive, and the most amazing thing ever. So we're going to end our service this morning the way we, we end our service every Sunday morning, with a song of worship and a song of invitation. This free gift of God, this free gift of grace is here available for all people.
So if you've never accepted that free gift of grace, if you've never named Jesus your Lord and Savior, and you've never been buried in baptism and washed in the blood, this is a good time to do it. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing, and we're going to worship. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. We thank you so much for the resurrection. And there, there are no words that we could even say to come close. That would come close to describing how grateful we are and how great you are. We were dead and lost in our sins. Living in rebellion. Being enemies of you. Yet while we were still sinners, you sent your son to die on a cross for us and spill his blood to cover our sins. But to not only that, not only that, to go into the grave and fight and defeat death so we can have hope. We love you and we are yours and we worship you right now. We worship you right now for everything that you have done for us. We love you and we are yours. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.